Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be continuing our look at Burning Chrome, the anthology by William Gibson from the mid-80s, and the story that we're looking at today is the Gernsback Continuum from 1981. A ghost is something that arises out of the past, but in the Gernsback Continuum the hero learns that the semiotic ghosts arising out of the hauntological future that lay before him are something that he would like to avoid entirely. He's haunted by them and he doesn't want them. In 1981, when William Gibson published this story, cyberpunk was probably a growing feeling uh, within him and many other writers of a refutation of the past. And now, what do I mean by that? Well, up until the 80s revelation of what would become cyberpunk as a, as a written form and Gibson, its main champion by far, uh, you know, outsizing all of the other authors in uh, skill and approach uh, at the time, is we had a vision of the future that was provided to us in the 30s and 40s. And this vision that we were provided with was given to us by Hugo Gernsback, the man for whom the Hugo Award is named after. Hugo had a lot of his own ideas and concepts and he, and he had a guiding set of principles which are all well worth investigating and looking into. They go beyond the scope of this video Needless to say, their influence is huge. And all through the golden age and the new wave and the doldrums of the 70s, up until the cyberpunk arrival in the 80s, Hugo Gernsback's legacy was definitely there. And what was happening uh, with that legacy was that science fiction had a vision of the future that was always a reflection of the past. And so what this gives you is the ability to write stories without doing the heavy lifting. Uh, what, what this allows you to do is have this golden age of uh, slipstream awesomeness and these, uh, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed uh, supermen, so to speak, uh, you know, from the 30s and the 40s. And all you had to do was uh, extrapolate that and carry that forward so that at first you had the colonizing expansionist uh, exploration into space. Man was going to get in rockets and go out into space and we were going to meet the other in the aliens and for the most part conquer them. It was going to be 100% uh, American-centric, human-centric. Later that progressed into the humanist scientists uh, heading out into space and meeting the other and trying to find commonality with them or to understand them, but also to help them uh, if, if they needed it and maybe to rescue them. This was all uh, part of Gernsback's influence on science fiction. You know, it was always there. So what we want to do is take that influence up until that point, which has led to what Gibson and his contemporaries considered a lot of lazy writing when it came to thinking about the future, because people were always inventing the future through the past and come up to here, cut that away, and now all you have before you is the future as your reference point. So you might be writing right now, but your reference point is only the future. And that requires an enormous amount of what you would call literary heavy lifting. And as slight as William Gibson looked at this time, he was definitely the powerlifting champion Paul Anderson of literary lifting. <laughs> so what we have here at the time of the writing of this story is that William Gibson basically putting out a, a uh, kind of a heads up or a message to everybody working in science fiction who was still using that uh, shiny happy past lens on the future that Hugo Gernsback had handed all of us because there's a lot of hypocrisy within that message. So let's talk about, just briefly, what was the hypocrisy in the message? The 1930s futurism of rockets bringing humanity to space to colonize planets and worlds and to spread humanity throughout the galaxy in a shiny, happy, you know, streamlined Art Deco vision of things to come uh, gave way in the 1940s to V2 rockets falling on the citizens of London. So what we had there was the dream that was offered and the reality. And so this was a big part of what cyberpunk wanted to talk about at the beginning of the 80s. And this is why they wanted to cut the past off because it seemed hypocritical to them and really 
if you just look at the example that I gave, it was. What was going on is that Gernsback and his future-minded folk from the past, still writing the future through that past, were ignoring the realities of fossil fuel and what it had done to the planet, to endless corporate wars after wars. We had Korea, we had Vietnam, you know, all of course after World War II. We had all the little wars that happened in between that you don't hear a lot about. Uh, the CIA was busy killing people all over Southeast Asia. There was a lot of stuff going on there. America was a dangerous presence throughout the world, but so was Russia, and so were some of our European allies. But what it all came out as was that we had been promised this future, but instead what we got was fossil fuel smog surrounding the planet and all of our great scientific advancements being used to kill people who weren't us. By the time it all came around, or it came to a head, in the 80s, there was a countercultural movement against it that arose within science fiction. And so the new kids, so to speak, were ready to reject all of the stuff that the old guys were doing. You know, the Gernsback and his visions of the future and seeing the future only through this past filter was something that the new people in science fiction didn't want to do. This new wave of authors in science fiction didn't want to go on carrying about the status quo. There were plenty of other people who were rejecting the status quo, uh, Michael Moorcock among them, and he had been doing so since the 60s in one form or another, Samuel R. Delaney as well. There were plenty of people who were challenging that status quo, but none of them were doing it exactly the way the cyberpunks were doing it. And so when it finally manifested, uh, one of the earliest manifestations that actually laid the message down right was the Gernsback Continuum. If you're really looking for the Ur story of cyberpunk, there are probably several great candidates, but this is probably the number one candidate. This is kind of the story where the sensibilities were laid down. Now, this is not per se a cyberpunk story, is it? I mean, we don't have uh, any of the other many, many hallmarks of cyberpunk science fiction. But one of the things that we do have in this story is this countercultural abandonment of the ghosts of the past and looking ahead to the ghosts of the future. And so that brings us to what happens when the hero faces the semiotic ghosts from the future. The hero of the story is hired to go out and do some photography work where he's going to photograph uh, old gas stations and buildings that reflect the Art Deco, Art Nouveau uh, time frame of the 30s into the 40s. You know, these buildings, they exist in the desert southwest and southern California. Uh, they jokingly refer to the uh, architect of these buildings as Ming the Merciless, which is kind of, that's, a, that's an interesting callback in the story. And what happens uh, in the course of the story is that the hero notices at one point that he has permeated a kind of a membrane in reality. And shortly after doing this, he sees what would be his first ghostly vision of the future come back to him in the now, his first semiotic ghost. Having seen his first semiotic ghost, it's a giant airship that is impossibly able to fly. The hero begins to realize that he has permeated into this realm and he wants to get out of it. And he has a friend who uh, works at a, like an inquirer kind of, you know, UFOs and Bigfoots kind of uh, big, big feet sighting, as they say in the story. Uh, but this guy is actually an expert at understanding uh, kind of the Jungian archetypal constructs that lead people to all kind of see very similar things when they see things like UFO, Bigfoot, monsters, other things like that, occurrences of various kinds. And the uh, solution to this problem is very novel. As the hero continues to have experiences seeing his repeated and recurring semiotic ghosts. And he continues to enlist the help of his friend who understands this problem and offers him a novel way to fix the problem. What the hero begins to realize is that that Gernsbachian promised future did not deliver. Rockets to the moon and rockets to other planets and exploration of space became nothing more than missiles and bombs falling on people in World War II. Missiles and bombs 
destroying humanity all across Korea, Vietnam, any number of adventures that America was up to up until 1981. And there are plenty. America wasn't the only country doing it too. There was plenty of death to go around and plenty of people dealing it. And the hero sees this vision of the past alive now and coming from the future to him in the form of these ghosts. And it really begins to break him. He wants to get away from it as quickly as he can. And he's looking for his novel solution. And as he's looking for it, that's when he begins to consider for the first time what was promised in the past and what has been delivered in the future is a complete lie. And so that leads to the uh, ultimate climax of the story, which is something that I don't want to ruin for you, but I still want to talk to you about. So just be warned, I'm going to share the end of the story here because I think it's important to understanding the, the mindset of the character. Cohen's congratulatory wire was forwarded to me in San Francisco a week later. Dialta had loved the pictures. He admired the way I'd really gotten into it and looked forward to working with me again. That afternoon, I spotted a flying wing over Castro Street, but there was something tenuous about it, as though it were only half there. I rushed into the nearest newsstand and gathered up as much as I could find on the petroleum crisis and the nuclear energy hazard. I'd just decided to buy a plane ticket to New York. Hell of a world we live in, huh? The proprietor was a thin black man with bad teeth and an obvious wig. I nodded, fishing in my jeans for change, anxious to find a park bench where I could submerge myself in hard evidence of the human near dystopia we live in. But it could be worse, huh? That's right, I said, or even worse. It could be perfect. Well, that isn't quite the end. There's a little after that. But that should help bring home that what the character is dealing with is that the future envisioned by Gernsback is madness. And we're damn lucky we didn't get the future that they promised us in the 30s. But the bigger question is, why did science fiction then go on to spend the next 50 years or more looking at the future through that Gernsbackian lens, through that Gernsback continuum. His answer became what we now call cyberpunk.